Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So in continuation of our summer farm tour series, today we are once again hanging out with one of my favorite farmers, Mr. Daniel Mays of Frith Farm in Scarborough, Maine, discussing the importance of the human element of Daniel's farm. Humans not just as employees, but as part of the ecology. I absolutely loved this conversation and I think it sort of reframes the idea of employees in a beautiful way. Uh, Daniel notably references his book in this conversation and well, it's fantastic and you should pick it up. Uh, it's called the No-Till Organic Vegetable Farm. I'll link that in the show notes. Also, of course, if you're curious about no-till systems in general and want to support our work, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com, where the proceeds go to things like sending my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson, up to film videos like this one. And I'm kind of jealous. Anyway, that's enough for me. Let's get into it with Daniel Mays of Frith Farm. Uh, so I'm Daniel Mays. Uh, we're here at Frith Farm uh, in Scarborough, Maine, Southern Maine. Yeah, Frith is, is an old English word uh, for, comes from the same root as friend, sort of like kinship or sanctuary. Um, so yeah, fitting with our values here, but also was the name of my great granddad's farm in England. So um, sort of carrying that on uh, as well, yeah. We grow mixed organic vegetables and some small fruit on uh, three and a half acres. Um, we are a CSA farm. We have 300 members, uh, 300 families who come to the farm each week during the season to pick up produce. Uh, that's maybe about 60% of our revenue. Um, then we have three natural food stores we sell to, it's maybe like 30%. And then we have a on-farm store. Um, and some other miscellaneous sort of sales that do the, the last 10%. Um, our model is no-till. Uh, we're a no-till permanent bed, sort of never, never see the soil farm. Um, so constantly mulching and trying to get as much life and diversity into the beds and into the farm as possible. Um, and that includes uh, humans. We have a lot of humans working on this land. Um, there are, I guess, 10 of us uh, seasonally, April through November. Uh, so we do most things by hand and we're sort of a very intensive production. Yeah, so we are mostly seasonal. I think of us as a three season farm, although we do sell a lot of storage crops, root crops through the winter. Um, so there are usually a couple people who stay on part time through the winter. Um, I end up working through the winter off and on. I do try and take a break, but um, a lot of sort of planning and purchasing and hiring happens in the winter. Yeah, so to grow on three and a half acres so intensively, uh, we do a lot of hand labor, but that labor mostly, um, I think of it as proactive. It's almost like um, we're doing a lot of spreading a mulch before we plant. Um, so bed prep is a lot of our time. And then the goal with that is that very little of our time is in the weeding and, and maintenance of those crops. Um, but then harvesting is, is a huge task. Um, I remember sort of realizing like, if we spend most of our time harvesting, then we're doing well, right? Cause that's the, that's the task that brings in the money and, and, the, and the product and the yield. So um, yeah, I'd say bed prep, uh, you know, some trellising, and pruning and then harvesting um, are our main, main jobs that require so many hands. For me, that growth was kind of dictated by the people. Like I just wanted to have offer this, uh, this life to more people. Um, so I think we are kind of at the limits logistically, you know, once a crew gets above 10, somewhere in there, there's like middle management starts setting in. Um, so, uh, I, that's why we haven't really grown more. Also our land base is, is limited. Um, but yeah, I think it scales down pretty well. I think there's really sort of that humans to acre ratio for me, it's about three humans per acre that allows us to grow intensively. And I think that scales down, you know, I've seen one person growing on a third of an acre and, and, and doing all right. So I, I think a lot about that. Of, there's this sort of drive culturally to eliminate labor. But I'm like, well, labor, that's humans. Like we're eliminating humans from the land. Is that really, you know, is that, is that our values? Are those our values? And 
uh, to me, it's it's not. It's like, how do we get more humans back on the land? I think we've, that's that's the direction we need to go. Yeah, we gross about a hundred thousand per acre, um, so three and a half acres, maybe just under three hundred and fifty thousand a year. Um, and yeah, in terms of where that goes, I'd have to look at the the spreadsheet breakdown. But um, you know, labor is our biggest cost. Um, although we do have an alternative labor model that, you know, we compensate in other ways than money as well. Um, so, so maybe that's not as big as, as other farms. Um, a lot gets reinvested in the farm in various ways. Um, I, I view mulch and compost and wood chips, that's, that's a reinvestment in the farm, um, but also in the infrastructure. Uh, we're constantly improving the housing for the crew. The, the whole crew lives on the farm. Um, so a lot has gone back into that uh, and just, yeah, improving quality of life. I think a lot about, you know, soil health and quality of life for people working on the farm. Those, those are one, <laughs> one topic. Um, you know, we are soil organisms, part of the food web. So, so yeah, generating health and vitality in our little community here. Um, so I reinvest in that, you know, we're sitting in a greenhouse we call the community greenhouse the purpose of this is to have a space to gather and be together we have our community meal here each week and um you know built a built a sauna last year for the for the crew and um so yeah there's a lot of reinvestment in that way um other you know inputs are probably more than well i don't know i guess i haven't compared that with other farms but we we buy in a lot of mulch other than that there's all the overhead which is yeah always frustrating but yeah yeah all the insurance and taxes and yeah um the bureaucratic fees of, of, of existing yeah a little over half of our food goes to our csa families um, who pick up it's entirely pick up on the farm we don't do drop-offs for that um it's maybe about 60 percent um the another 30 percent goes to three different natural food stores the, sort of the closest natural food stores to us here um, all within 15 miles. Um, I should say we have, you know, we're in Scarborough, Maine, suburb of Portland. This is where the people live in Maine. You know, the populations are, are higher here. So, uh, you know, it's not a big city. Portland's, I think, like 60,000 or something. But um, it's, it's enough that our market is pretty solid. We, we're, we're spoiled that way. We don't have to drive very far. Um, and then, yeah, so 60% to CSA, 30% to natural food stores and then about 10 percent uh goes to the farm store um, although also sort of yeah some miscellaneous sales in there too i'd say the farm store might be closer to you know five to seven percent um it's a pretty small slice of our pie yeah so we kind of have the farm store uh mainly for the crew here like the 10 of us who live here um so a, our farm store has produce in it from our farm but it also has sort of bought in you know, it's like a tiny little co-op or something, you know, bought in gro local groceries and, and grains and legumes and stuff. So that that's sort of just us wanting to have our own little source of, of grocery shopping on the farm and figure may as well open it up to the community as well. Um, so that, honestly, if it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't have a farm store. Um, and the reason for that is CSA is so much more efficient for our business model. Um, to ha to know when everyone is coming, have everything picked fresh for that moment, um, and t t yeah, just to know what to harvest um, without having to constantly sort of replenish and check on quality in, in the farm store day to day. So again, we're kind of spoiled with that. We have the customer base to support that. Um, and I should say our CSA also offers choice. I think that's a key feature of it because um, some people would not be a part of it if it didn't. So, so customers get to choose what items they take, half shares, any six items, whole share, any 12 items. And they can double down, you know, take, they could take 12 bunches of kale if that's what they wanted to do. Um, and that freedom has enabled us to grow our CSA because people aren't wasting the food. You know, they're not taking food home that they don't want to eat. When we started the CSA, it didn't offer choice. It was a set, you know, take one bunch of kale, one head of lettuce, etc. cetera. Um, but I think maybe about eight years ago, I came to that switch, sort of light bulb went off of like, oh, surveys were telling me, you know, the number one reason why people didn't return was because they didn't want to waste food. So they're taking home food that 
uh, they don't want to eat and then they that goes in the compost and then they feel bad and don't sign up again so making that switch was was fundamental it's like this merging of you know we're we're catering to the customer but also to our flow and our quality of life um, and there's Sometimes there's this pressure of like, the customer's always right, we need to bend over backwards. Like if they want to do custom deliver orders, we'll deliver it to their door in the middle of the night. And, and um, I've really resisted that. I, I, you know, our model is very much sort of, you know, come to the farm, see what we do, pick some flowers while you're here, bring, bring your kids, run around. Um, and then even in our CSA setup, you know, we're not packaging each thing with a sticker and, you know, all of that cost and, and time is saved because, you know, we have bins of lettuce mix with tongs and it says, you know, take a third of a pound and there's scales and people weigh out and hopefully they bring their own packaging that's reusable and we're not, you know, generating that waste. Um, so, you know, just all the time of bagging and bunching, you know, we do bunch kale and, and chard and things like that just to keep it from being a mess. But um, we're, we're handling things way less than we would if we were having to, uh, you know, deliver it's almost like, uh, you know, be who you are and maybe you'll have fewer friends, but they'll be really good friends. <laughs> it's like you try to please everyone and you're going to be, you know, it'll be less authentic, but you'll have a million friends who don't really know you. So this is the same thing with the farm. Yeah. Community is this word that gets thrown around like, yeah, like we're all community and, and there's so many different kinds of community. There's online communities now, but for me, community is like direct relationship, direct relationship and, and, uh, that's been really important part of this farm is is being a space for community to to generate to happen um, those relationships to develop so we've invested in you know we have this courtyard space that's open to the public and to our customers and we've built some like a sandbox for the kids and a little playhouse and this community greenhouse uh, we have events uh, we have some live music you know sort of burger night events um, we also do education um, you know, related to farming and growing, gardening. Uh, we have like community harvest days, like like community carrot harvest in the fall, um, where like a million people come from age zero to 100 and um, it's like the most inefficient harvest ever. It's just trampling the beds and it's a beautiful disaster and we all have a lot of fun and people take home carrots um, as, as their pay for that, you know. Uh, so, so those kind of events are, you know, they're not only fun and they build community, but they, you know, you could take an economic lens and say they build resilience into the farm. If, if there's ever a need, if we need, you know, if we have a, a challenge or whatever, like there are people who see the farm as like an extension of their home and are almost like family and their, their kids have grown up here. Um, you know, that's the kind of resilience you can't sort of like build into a marketing plan. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's based on relationship. I'm constantly questioning the sort of mainstream economic narratives because, you know, you know, you can look where the main, where they've gotten us and where they're going. And, and certainly there's some value there. We, you know, we've got to fit into the world and make a living. Um, but yeah, to, to, to ask for help can be a gift. It's like a vulnerable gift. Of like, you know, cause you might get rejected, but like you can get like the connection that comes from that is amazing and and to have a foundation of of community and relationship to be able to even make that ask is so yeah so beautiful it's it's uh yeah i don't know i was like why why live any other way you know yeah i'm really glad we touched on on labor on humans as yeah. part of the farm ecosystem i think that's so important often when we think of like soil health or ecosystem health we're in our minds we're removing humans from that and it's sort of this nature as this pristine idea um, but I really strive to reintegrate us humans back into that soil food web um, you know I think of us as you know some people integrate livestock and run them through like that's what we're doing we're you know we're animals moving over the land we are adding our, our energy to it our diversity to it um, so so yeah I'm glad that's a part of this discussion um, for me that's a huge part of why to farm this way that's a huge benefit um not just to the farm and soil health and all that but to the community and to the the ripples it generates out into the the human world as well the first thing i start with the apprentices you know we didn't talk too much about that but we have an educational model of sort of like incubating farmers 
the first thing we go into is uh, the, the question, how do you want your life to be? If you, if you can't answer that question, then other people will answer it for you, you know? So really getting into that, how do you want your life to be? How do you want your farm to be? And having that drive decisions. Yeah, and certainly the economics are part of that, you know? Everyone wants to be able to feed themselves. <laughs> Uh, but there's more to it than that, yeah. Yeah, so everything I talk about, I go into much greater detail and am more thoughtful about in, in my book, uh, The No-Till Organic Vegetable Farm. Uh, that's available anywhere you buy books. Um, we also offer intensive workshops on our systems and, and no-till practices in general. Uh, you can find those on our website, frithfarm.net. F-R-I-T-H um, or also we'll announce it on uh, I think we just announced it on our Instagram uh, at Frith Farm um, and Facebook at Frith Farm as well yeah. uh, Enormous thank you to Daniel and to Jackson who filmed and edited this video real quick before you go don't forget to check out the show notes for some conferences where you can find me this winter of 2023-2024 uh, pick up a hat or this book or you can just go to patreon.com slash no till growers and sign up. Or you can hit that super thanks button. That also works. It is because people do those things that we can do these things like making content for you. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. And kitty cat is nowhere to be found. I'm sorry. Oh, she's inside looking at me. Yeah, that's where those, yeah, those community connections, I mean, it's almost like mycelial connections for a root. It's like, that's what gives it resistance. So yeah, I, I think a lot about how I can remove myself. I'm even starting now to remove myself as like the centerpiece of this place because it needs to grow its own legs and, you know, become its own organism. So yeah, that can be hard for farm owners. But I think there's so much gold in that. If, yeah, once I, it's a freeing thing too. If I'm, if I'm just a part of this organism, it's just so much more resilient than if I'm the linchpin for every single thing that happens here. Yeah. Right, right, as I age out, yeah. A um, lot of thoughts, a lot of dreams. Um, I'm hesitant to even say them because they're just sort of in the speculative stage, but I, I'm looking into questioning like how to make it uh, more of a cooperative or co-owned uh, model um, where ownership is fluid and can come and you know people can come and go and step into that um, so there's security for the long term but also you know not locking people in um, so looking at different legal structures different economic models of, of that because um, yeah as I think about this place beyond me it's like it needs to have a different model or else, like, what I pass it on to one of my children, but that's weird pressure. Maybe they don't want that, you know, um, or find someone else to take the place. But um, that that can work. But I feel like that can happen now. Like, and then we can like share it and grow in it together instead of like, oh no, I'm getting old. Who am I going to give it to? Um, so yeah, thinking of, of growing those mycelial connections and, and feeding those relationships like now while I'm more or less in my prime, you know.